I never prepare a sermon for a church, Pastor Patsy. I never prepare a sermon so I can, I didn't prepare a sermon so I could come preach here. I get into the word and I study and I prepare before time. For when the Lord calls, I'm ready. And he gave me this message some time ago. So when she called, I said, I know who this message is for. This message is for here. God always does things ahead of time. He prepares things ahead of time. Before, before we even end, we ended up at your house, we, God had prepared the place for us. Through Rudy's heart, he had prepared a place to speak to you. He had prepared a place to minister to us, to be, everything was set up. Everything was set up for God to do things. Somebody say, God, say it with me. God is always setting us up. There's always a plan. All the time. Nothing comes without God's plan. So God always prepares everything way before because he knows it's going to happen. The Bible even says that even before the foundation of the world, he provided the lamb of life. Why? Because he knew that at some point, Adam and Eve were going to take a bite of the fruit. Oh, come on. So even in your shortcomings, even if you're falling, even if you're mess ups, even whatever's going on, say God always has provision. He always has a way out. You just need to find it. And so as I was getting this message ready, he was preparing us for today. And so... Uh, so I said, okay, here's this message. I'm going to put it in my laptop. I mean, in, in my laptop, and then I transfer it to my iPad. And I said, okay, wherever I'm going to preach this, this is where it is for whoever I'm going to preach it to. And whoever's here is here. And whoever's listening out of there, listening online, they're listening online. Whoever's going to hear it later, they're going to hear it later. But this is for you right now. You're here at the right place at the right moment for the right time. This is for you. This is for us. This is for you. This is for this church. So, Father, I thank you because I've already been blessed. You've already sung to me. We've sung to you. You've already spoken to me. Thank you for uh, anointing me. My lips are your lips. My mind is your mind. My soul is your soul. My spirit is engaged to yours. We are one. And so what you have to speak to this church today, I honor you for it. I worship you for it. I thank you for it. And Lord, I know that you have things prepared for us that are mighty and powerful. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. One of the things before I go into the message, the Lord was giving me this as I was standing right there. One of the things that happens most of the time in our lives is that we let natural stuff interrupt our flow. The reason more revivals are not happening, the reason more churches are not, you know, moving, the reason things are not happening is because there is, there is something in the, in the natural that always interrupts the spiritual. It always gets in the way. How many of you remember a prophet named Elijah? And one day he went and, and, and this guy went and, and, and he defeated the prophets of Baal and he was all gone ho and he made fire rain from heaven and he was all excited and everything. But as soon as he did that, there was a queen named Jezebel that sent word to him that said, by this time tomorrow, what you did to my prophets, I'm going to do to you. And the man, instead of getting more bold, he's like, patitas pa que son, he just, he took off, he peeled out of there, you know. And boom, he took off. And he took off into the wilderness till he got to this place. But, you know, somebody say, God had a plan. This wasn't part of the message this morning. I'll get, believe me, I'll finish. But uh, he said this, he said, God had a plan. He said, I'm going to send you to this place because I need you to rest. Because then you're going to come back and you're going to do extraordinary things. You're going to, not only that, you're going to, you're going to, number one, you're going to anoint a new king. And number two, then you're going to anoint your successor. You're going to anoint the prophet that's going to come after you, which was Elisha. So I want you to go rest. So he went to a river creek, and when he got there, he sat there. He says, okay, there's famine in the land. Everything's dry. Nothing. It hasn't rained. And I'm going to tell you, give you a little nugget. Some, somebody say, I love nuggets. 
That's going to cost you a $5 offering. So, so, uh, but I love nuggets. And so, so there's a little nuggets. How many of you remember when he made fire rain from heaven? But first he has that they, they pour all the water on the, on the altar. Yes or no? And that they make uh, around that they make this uh, almost like, like a pit surrounding it. So that way they could, a trench, so that way they could fill it with water. Do you know why he did that? He didn't do that to show them that, oh, even with the water, God was going to, the, the spirit of God or the fire of God was going to lick it up. He was doing that to prevent the wildfire because it was dry. There was a drought. You have to be wise. Even in the manifestation of the spirit of God, even in the fire of God, even in the, mass, the manifestation and the glory, even in these revivals that are happening, we need to be careful that instead of it becoming God getting all the glory, it becomes a wildfire that's going to destroy rather than bless. We got to have wisdom. Come on, say, we got to have wisdom. And so when the fire came, guess what? It licked up all the water and didn't go over. But then he goes to this creek. It's dry, and God told him something. You're going to go to this creek. I'm going to provide water for you. Somebody say provision is here. I'm going to provide water for you, but I'm also going to do something. I'm going to send this raven that's going to go, and he's going to feed you in the morning bread and meat, and he's going to feed you bread and meat in the evening, alpha and omega, beginning and end. That's the fullness of a time. That's the fullness of a day. But I need you to understand something about ravens. Ravens are opportunistic animals. They're scavengers. And so the raven had to die to its character. The raven had to submit. God tells her, hey, come here, raven. Yeah, I need you to do me a favor. I know you like to eat meat and bread. And if you find it somewhere and you take it, you're going to eat it. Because you're a scavenger. But I need you to die to your nature so you can feed my prophet. I hope you're getting this. Sometimes we need to die to our nature so the prophetic can manifest itself. Sometimes we need to die to doubt so the prophetic can manifest itself. Sometimes we need to kill the nat natural things in us that prevent God's word to speak to us because we doubt. So we need to die to our natural, our natural character, who we are, doubters or unbelievers at times or, or maybe questioning things. We need to die so God can feed us. And he told, he said, you know what, I'm going to take care of you later. But for, for a few days, I need you to go get bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And I'm going to tell you something, God is providing ravens to feed the people of God, in the morning, in the evening, in the fullness of a day, in the fullness of a time, God will use things that you never think he will use. And he will have them die to their character. And I'm prophesying today that things are about to change in this country. That even some of the evil we have seen, God is about to go and even speak to the governments. And he's going to go and he's going to make their character die, their nature die of being evil so they can feed the church, so they can feed the people of God. Revival is about to hit the United States of America. It's about to hit this country again. And I'm telling you, I'm prophesying that it's about to turn around. The ravens are about to feed us. We're expecting that all the feeding comes from good Christian people. But sometimes people that feed your spirit is like that testimony. I know she meant, she, I, was, I know she meant well. I know she, she wanted her house. That was her. That was her intention to keep her house. But then she, she sees those tears. And suddenly she had to die. Pastor Patsy had to die to her to her nature, to the way she liked things, so that others could be blessed. But look, look what happened. Look what happens when we nod to our neighbor. You know what? Do you think I wanted to be a preacher and be here? I saw my mom grow up as a we saw we're, we're preachers, kids. We saw our parents. I had I didn't want to have to do anything with preaching, anything with prophecy, anything with ministry. And for five years I did nothing but party. But my mom prayed and said, There's a calling in your life. There's a calling in your life. And at some point, I had to die to Juan Carlos Cantu, to JC, so that God could live and God could bring me here one day and that I could preach to you out of Acts 28, chapter 1 and verse 6, all the way through so I can preach to you about a man named Paul. Come on, how many of you are ready for this message this morning? So Paul was a faithful witness to 
the life-changing power of the Lord Jesus Christ from the, from the day Paul met Jesus as he was on his road to Damascus. From that day on, I remember that Paul was on his way to kill more Christians. Paul was on his way to destroy more people. Paul was on his way to do what he thought was right. And then, of course, God slaps him off his horse or whatever he was riding, a, a mula, a vaca, whatever he was on. But just God slaps him off. And when he falls on the ground, he says, well, who's this? What are you doing with me? And you know the whole story. How many of you remember the story of Saul turning into Paul? So Paul became a mighty preacher of the gospel after that because what he did, what God did, is he took that which he's doing wrong and then he manifested it the other way because that's what God does. He turns you from the inside out and that which you used to do against him, then he's going to use you to do it for him. Oh, come on. Whatever you're doing right now that you used to, whatever people are doing right now that used to do it against him, he's going to flip it out and he's going to do it. He's going to turn it around so now they use it for the kingdom of God because that's the way the Lord works. He always flips things around. We think we have it all done. We think we have it all good. But he think he has everything in order. Come on, say he has everything in order. And so, so Paul had been preaching, had done all the preaching in, in Rome. And, and, and Caesar heard things about him. And they were upset because he left. You know, he was a citizen of Rome. And they were upset. And he was going to go to jail. He was going to go to prison. And, 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 and often I asked the Lord the same thing. I said, Lord, why did Paul end up in prison? How many of you have ever asked yourself, why, Lord? Why did Paul end up, thank you. Why would Paul end up in prison? Man, he was preaching the gospel, Lord. Why would you allow him to go to a little jail? And then the Lord answered me. He said, if I don't sit him down in the little prison, in little four walls, he'll never write three-fourths of the Gospels, three-fourths of the Bible. Because he would have never sat down. Sometimes God will take the place where you're imprisoned, and that's when the best will come out of you. Sometimes we question God why we're doing, why we're at where we're at. Why did this happen, Lord? Because the Lord says, that's the only place that you would pay attention to me to write what I told you to write. That's the only place, Paul, where you would sit down and you would listen to my spirit so you could start writing letters to the Corinthians, to the Romans. Come on. To everybody that you could start writing epistles and letters that later would become the word, the very word of God by which we preach and live by. And sometimes your testimony of what you're going through will become that living letter. The Bible says that the word became flesh. Come on, say the word became flesh. The word has to become so flesh in you that you don't have to speak the word. You just live the word. You just walk the word. You are the living word of God walking on this planet earth. Why? Because you were in a prison, maybe a prison of sickness, and you discovered that God could heal, and you glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. And then you start preaching healing by walking in healing. Come on. This woman should be in bed laying down right now and say, you know what? Somebody, we have a speaker. I could be. But she's here because she knows God got something for you today. He's got something for us. And so as Paul is going and he's going to prison, they have to put him on a boat. Come on. Somebody say a boat. And in chapter 20, 27, of the book of, of Acts, we read all this story where he ends up in a shipwreck. But as he was in this shipwreck, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase the word for the sake of time because I have some words to share before we get out of here. Uh, as he was in this shipwreck, he says the angel of the Lord appeared to him. We were just talking about the angel. My wife and I get into these deep, deep studies. Somebody say the angel of the Lord equals Jesus. So the same one that knocked him off the horse reappeared to him. He appears to him and he says, hey, there's a storm coming. Ooh. There's a storm coming, but whoever is on board will not perish. I know this church has gone through a storm, but whoever remained on board will not perish. I hope you hear that prophetically. Whoever stayed on board is whoever's going to survive it and receive the blessing of the Lord. Come on. They're going to receive life in that abundance. They're going to receive freedom. But you have to stay on board. That's the key. So the angel of the Lord speaks to him and says, whoever stays on board will survive. Nobody will perish as long as they're on board. You have to be on board. The vision continues. You have to be on board. If you're not on board, 
And I'm not, and I'm not cursing anybody. I'm not saying that if somebody left because I don't want to be here anymore, they're cursed. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the Lord is speaking to whoever's here. The Lord is speaking to whoever's on board. Because whoever's on board with a vision will live life and life abundant in this vision. And through this vision, they'll be blessed. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be church members. I don't even believe in church membership. That's for Sam's club. This was not Rudy's club. This is this, you know, this, this you know. This, I mean, you're, this is like Hotel California. Once you come one day, you belong here and you can never check out. Once you come once to Freedom Life, that's it. You belong to Freedom Life. That's it. You can never leave. Come on, you be, you've heard of Hotel California. Oh, that's music is of the devil, Pastor. There you are in high school. I'm not going to go in there. Anyway. They're all hearing it right now. Welcome to the Hotel California. Such a lovely place. Yeah. Anyway. I know. You're hearing it in your mind right now. I thought those kind of... Come on, mijo. Get on the keyboard. Let's sing it. <laughs> How many of you know God has a plan? God has a plan for this church. And as the storm came, they shipwrecked. And Paul, all that remained were leftovers of the ship, planks. And for days, Paul held on to a, a, a plank, a piece of wood, and floating and drifted in the water for days till he got to an island called Malta. But imagine you're floating and all you have left in life is just a plank, a piece of board. All you have left is a hallelujah. All you have left is thank you, Lord. And you're holding on to that dear plank. All you have left is a prophetic word that was spoken to you many years ago. All you have left is a word that was preached to you by your pastor before he left. All you have left is something that the Lord spoke to you. And if that's all you have, you need to hold on to it tight and float in the water as long as you can. Because at some point you'll end up in Malta. At some point, you'll end up in your destination. Somebody praise the Lord this morning. I hope you are listening to the word of God this morning. I don't care if your ship is wrecked right now. As long as you hold on to a word, as long as you hold on to a piece of wood, you're going to get to your destination. It's a promise of God. I'm sorry, I'm a little evangelistic sometimes. But he said, he floated for days, but nobody perished. Because they were on board. When you're on board with God, even if you have a piece of wood left, this is no Titanic. You're not going to freeze in the water. No, Jack's not going to sink. Now they're going to start singing Titanic. Oh, God, Holy Spirit, help me. I'm taking them through a trip. By the way, it's in the movie, the 25th anniversary of Titanic, and I don't get paid for that commercial. But the angel of the Lord brought comfort to Paul and brought him a word to say, you will not perish. Turn around to somebody and tell him, the Lord said, we will not perish. Freedom Life, the Lord said, you will not perish. The Lord said, it's not over. Just because the man is gone doesn't mean it's over. You will not perish. Just because a storm came and rocked the ship, you will not perish. Just because there was a disruption in life, you will not perish. How many of you remember that? This is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. When Jesus went to the other side, he said, he's on the edge of a lake and he tells the disciples, let's get on this boat and I want us to go to the other side. Come on, say, let's go to the other side. And then suddenly in the middle of that, how many of you remember the storm? And then water starts coming into the boat. What is Jesus doing? He's asleep. He grabbed a pillow. And these guys are panicking. How many of you remember COVID? What was it called? <laughs> a pandemic. <laughs> they were in panic. We're going to perish. We're going to die. Or, or the, the recession. We're going to die. They're giving money to Ukraine and not to us. We're going to perish, Lord. Look at the gas prices. I'm going to tell you something about that. You know what? 
I can't believe you trusted God when gas was one, 150, but you can't trust him when gas is $5. God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he provided for you at 150, he's surely going to provide for you at $5 because we don't depend on the economy for God's provision. We trust in his provision that even when there isn't, there is. Come on. God always has a Joseph in the palace ready, waiting for us so that when drought comes at the right moment and we show up, there's more than abundance in there. Come on. That's another message for another Sunday. But, but he said, let's go to the other side. And they were panicking and they were perishing. And then Jesus gets up and what does he do? He gets mad. What are you doing? But where, don't you see we're going to die? No, we're not. What do you mean we're not going to die? He stops the storm. And here the lesson is not, God doesn't want you to stop the storm because storms come every day. So you're going to be, stop, 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 stop. That's not the intention of the teaching there. What God wants you to learn is for you to sleep during the storm. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Jesus was not supposed to die on the boat. He was supposed to die on the cross. And when you know the destiny of where you're headed, it doesn't matter what storm comes and it seems it's going to rock you. You go to sleep peacefully. Come on, somebody say, get a pillow. Tell your neighbor, get a pillow. Call the pillow guy. I think he's running for president or something like that. Come on, somebody tell me. Please start preaching already. Come on. Please start preaching already. So Paul finally gets to Malta. And when he gets there, it's cold. Somebody say, it's cold. So they start gathering wood. Because when it gets cold, you gather wood so you can start a fire. And the natives were already there, and they said that they were very welcoming. And so as they're welcoming them and there, and there's a promise in the Bible. Come on, somebody say, there's a promise in the Bible that even if you take up serpents in your hands, you will not die. That doesn't mean you go look for rattlesnakes and start dancing with them because they're going to bite you. But he said that while he was gathering wood, a viper stuck on and grabbed onto him. In verse 3, it says that a viper, come on, say a viper, latched onto his hand. We have a friend that we were talking about that one day we were talking about tarantulas. And she said that a tarantula got on her hand. And my wife and I were waiting to say, did it bite you? What did it do? What did it? No, no, my Lisa, see, se cayó. She's Lisa, see. Lisa, see. She shook it off. I just went like that. Lisa, see. It's so funny the way she does it. She's all dramatic about the, the tarantula. Yeah, it's a tarantula. It was big. It got on my hand. I said, it's okay. So what did you do? I just went like that. But the other way. Oh, Rosa de Guadalupe, you know, on me, all novela on me, and, you know, I just went like that. Don't get all, but that's how people are. Ah, I got bitten, and then you just shake it off. Tanto guato. And so when this first snake got him, this snake got him. Come on, say, the, the snake got him. I want to talk to you about three snakes and finish out the sermon with three snakes and, that come and try to destroy our lives. There's three snakes that had tried to destroy this is a prophetic word for this church that tried to destroy freedom life. There's three snakes that will try to latch on to this church and try, and then the people around will see it. And there's three things that this church has gone to. This is a prophetic word for you. But in the end, there's victory. You're going to see what I'm talking about. So the very first snake, when it bit him, is the snake of crisis. Come on, say the snake of crisis. How many of you know this church went through a crisis? It was a heart crisis. How many of you have ever gone through a crisis? This word is also personal for you because it's also a word for you, for me this morning. We all go through crisis, yes or no? We all have had shipwrecks, yes or no? We're all headed to Malta. And sometimes we're even going through all this stuff while we're on our way to prison. Because that's the only way God will settle us down to do what he planned to do with us. 
Why did you get, why did you, why did I lose that job? I really loved it. I had been there 20 years, Lord, because I want you over here in this place where I have something better for you. Because in that job, you would have never heard my voice because you were dependent on the salary of that job. But over here where you're going to make less, you're going to call on the name of the Lord. You're going to seek my face. You're going to say, Lord, I am not making what I was making there. Yeah, but over there, you didn't seek for me. You didn't even thank me. You weren't even grateful for what you had. But if I put you here where you're barely making it sometimes, and until you grow in your faith again and learn that it is through me that you're getting what you're getting, then guess what? You're never going to get back over there. Oh, come on. Sometimes God will disrupt our things. So this snake came, and the very first thing that happened is the snake of crisis. Of course, we know God took care of the poison. He didn't die. We know the story with that. But here's the problem. The crisis came when Paul was engaged in doing good. He was in the middle of gathering wood so there could be a fire. And here's this snake that had been dormant under the wood because when it's cold, we know that snakes are lethargic. Come on, how many of you know that the enemy is lethargic when there's no fire? It's not till revival shows up in the church. It's not till fire starts happening in the church that the snakes will wake up. You'll never know what snakes are hidden in a place till revival shows up and the fire shows up. And then suddenly that's when the snakes will start coming out. That's when they'll start latching on to you and try to stop you and kill you. Because unless you light up a fire, oh my God, I'm preaching this morning. Unless you bring the fire of God in your life, the snakes will never wake up. Somebody didn't hear me this morning. Come on. It's not till you light up the fire. It's not till you get the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life that the snakes will wake up. Because snakes will not move in cold. So if there's no, been no attacks here lately, then you need to light up a fire. Somebody say, I am the wood that God needs to light up the fire. Come on. And so after the episode on the ship where he saved everyone's life, Paul could have demanded special treatment and say, hey, I'm the, I'm the one here that's in charge. It was because of me that God helped you all survive. But no, he still helped gather wood. He still remained humble. Come on, this is Paul. Paul, Paul that had all this citizenship, Paul that knew all the law, Paul that had been with the Lord. This is Paul. He could have been arrogant and he could have said, you gather the wood. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait. No, he went and gathered wood for himself. I'm going to tell you something. The devil, the only time the devil will come and disrupt your life and try to kill you is when you're doing the good. When you're doing something for the kingdom of God, that's the only time he'll attack you. Because as long as you're sitting down, as long as you're not doing anything, you'll be lethargic like he is. Mm -hmm. We seem to believe that our faithful service to the Lord is some kind of shield <laughs> against trouble in our life. And here we go doing religious things that we've done forever. This is another little nugget. Come on, say little nugget. How many of you have ever played the blood of Jesus for protection in your life? Okay, that's wrong. The blood is not for protection. Ooh, I'm going to kill a sacred cow. You know where we got that from? We got it from the scripture where they put the blood over the post of the, and the angel, right? And the angel of death. Who sent that angel? Did the devil send that angel? Who sent the angel of death over the Egyptians? Who? Then why are we using the blood to protect us from the enemy? Ooh, silence of the lambs. <laughs> well, then the blood doesn't protect us from the enemy? No. The blood protects you from God. Because when the blood of Jesus covers you, it protects you from the wrath of God. So every time God sees you, his wrath doesn't come upon you because he sees the blood of the lamb shed on the cross for you. Mm. Oh, come on. We give too much power to the enemy. Every time people sin, the devil may be doing I didn't know the devil had that much power over you, more than the Holy Spirit. We give too much credit to the enemy. The enemy has no power. 
He doesn't stop because he sees the blood of Jesus. He stops because he sees the identity of a son of God standing right there. The blood doesn't stop the devil. The identity of who you are stops the devil. He says, I can't mess with that person. Even if I tried to mess with that person like a snake, I can't do anything because I tried to bite him and he didn't even die. He just went, I see. Tell our friend she's going to owe me for a sermon that I preached using her. Come on, somebody say. Somebody say this is not just everyone. This is Job. Come on, say Job. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Come on, Daniel, Elijah, the disciples, everybody. We've seen it time and time and time again. When there is trouble, the troubles come when they're preaching the gospel. When they're doing something for the kingdom. That's the only time you're going to get a snake of crisis in your life. That's it. If you're doing nothing for the kingdom, they don't care. Come on, somebody say, we got to put a fire to it. I got to move on. I got to move on. I have too much notes right here. Come on, say, say, shake the snake off. The snake of Christ needs to come off. Shake it off. Come on, shake it off. No more crisis. Come on. Say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know why you can say that word? How many of you have been crucified with Jesus? But you know what else, else happened? Where did Jesus go after the cross? Anybody? No, right, right away. Where did he go? Right after he died, where did he go? He went down. What did he go do? Okay, so if you got crucified with him, where did you go with him afterwards? To hell. So you already went to hell. You're not going to go to hell again. If you were crucified with him, you went to hell with him, but then you resurrected with him. And now he's seated at the hand of the right hand of the father. Guess where you're seated? The Bible says we're seated in heavenly places together with Jesus. But here we are. Cuando vas a venir, Señor? When are you coming? Oh, this whole Jesus is coming soon thing. Ugh. I've been hearing that since I was six. Jesus is not coming back soon. He's just coming when he's coming. Stop trying to see the signs. I saw the no, Stop. There's no signs. But there's a lot of wars. There was wars 2,000 years ago. But homosexuality, there was homosexuality 2,000 years ago. But there's divorce. There was divorces 2,000 years ago. But there's more sickness. There was sickness 2,000 years ago. Those are not the signs of the coming of Jesus. What Jesus needs is a manifested church that will go and preach the gospel of the kingdom and transform people's lives instead of standing there like people looking at the sky for UFOs. Because you know what? It doesn't matter when he comes. I don't care if he comes tomorrow. I don't care if he comes in 300 years. I don't care. All I care about is to preach this life-giving word of God to change somebody's life. And when he comes, he comes. Try, stop trying to figure out the numbers. Okay, let's go to the next one. The next snake is the snake of criticism. Come on, say snake of criticism. As soon as Paul was bitten, the people of the island started to criticize him. Oh, they lost their pastor in that church. You know, we, we grew up in that stuff. He must have been in sin. Tenía otra. He had another one. Now I'm going to tell you something. Rudy was the most holiest, purest man. I don't care what you say. Uh, and the <laughs> so I don't care. <laughs> I don't care how he was at home. No, just kidding. But everyone I've ever spoken to, that man had the purest heart, Patsy. You know, if you... Ask me to describe Pastor Rudy. Next to his name, I would have put the word Jesus. He was one of the closest people to Jesus I've ever met. And I mean that. He's, he's watching. Somewhere. And I mean that, that. He was amazing. He was very peaceful, loving, bien calmado. And I'm like, ¿Qué pasó, Jay-Z? ¿Cómo estás? Y yo acá todo emocionado. And he's like, oh, Rudy, how are you? Doing good. Denle café este hombre o algo. So they started to criticize. Oh, and that could, he must have been in sin. That church must be doing something wrong. 
Yes or, yes or no, Pastor Patty, that there's criticism all the time. Always criticized. The people of God. How many great people of God have been criticized? And so the people in the island, once he got bitten, oh, he was on a shipwreck. He got bitten. He must be in sin. He must, something must be wrong with him. Algo try. Man, God can't prosper you because oh, they're doing something. I'm not, I'm not, they go to Mexico a lot. You can't buy a brand new car because you go to Mexico a lot. Yes or no? Really, for real. You can't get sick because you, you must have been in sin. Or it was the devil. But come on, somebody say with me. Thank you, honey. Somebody say with me. Somebody say with me. Somebody say this with me. Criticism. Criticism comes when you're doing something right. And so he was getting criticized, the snake of criticism, the viper of criticism. He must have done something evil in his life. Neptune, the god of the sea, did not take him, but the snake will take him. Maybe they didn't die when they left that other building over there in the shopping center. Maybe they didn't die when they lost a house or when they lost a car. Maybe they didn't die when they went through another crisis. Maybe they didn't die. They've gone through so much. Come on. You know, there's a story where, again, remember I told you at the beginning where a lot of times people will, will uh, we don't understand why God does what he does ahead of time. But I remember that uh, we thought that we were going to have a little girl with our youngest son. His name is Carlos. My oldest lives in New York. He thinks he's a socialite. He works for Apple. But Dios lo trae la cola ya. He got him right there. You know, I, I don't want him to be in ministry. I just want him to be centered in, 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 in God, and he is. He's on his journey right there. He's 27, 27 already. Our daughter's 24. She's uh, 25, right? 25. She's, man, they grow so fast. She's, uh, she's a teacher just like mom. My wife's a kindergarten teacher. And she's a teacher too. And then our youngest is 19. He is at Southwestern Assemblies of God University. He's at Sago. They said they're about to have revival there. They just had Robert Madu for their chapel service this past week. Robert Madu. He says, he didn't know who Robert Madu was, by the way. He's like, Dad, everybody's the coaches. Everybody's telling me Robert Madu's coming. He's like, what? Robert Madu's coming to here? He said, yeah, he graduated from here. He's going to be there? Yeah. Man. My friend tried to get him in, but he couldn't. He was so busy. He said, well, he's going to be at chapel. Can I go to your chapel? Anyway, he said, Dad, he preaches just like you. Oh, thank you. But my son, my son was supposed to be a little girl. Because all the, what do you call them, the sonograms, showed that he was going to be a little girl. But the jewel was hidden. You know, sometimes that happens. He hid his stuff. I don't know how he did it, but somewhere it just kind of <laughs> went backwards. And you know, the other two things kind of, you know, you can, you got the mind, and they, and they covered it, so it looked like a little girl. And guess what we did? We bought a ton of grown stuff. And then we used to go preach at a church uh, in, in Eagle, Roca Firme. And I remember the whole church blessed us with tons of earrings and grown clothes and everything because we're going to have a little girl. And then the day, I even bought a pink camera that would take pink pictures. You know, there was no digital quick back then. And so I get in there, and as soon as I said, where's Mika? We painted the room purple and pink for her. And then, wow, where's Mika? It's not a Mika, it's a Mika. What? No, it's a girl. It's another print. No, it's a Mika. Boom, flop, it flops out. She starts peeing me. He anointed me since he was born. And I'm like, what are we going to do with all this stuff? But right about the same time, there was a woman named Patsy that had a baby inside of her that was a little girl. And I don't know if you remember this, but when your daughter was born, we came to San Antonio. And we, watched, we brought you a box with all of our daughter stuff that was supposed to be meant for my daughter that ended up with your daughter. 
And that was the reward that God gave back to you for taking care of my daughter. Because there was even little earrings that were stud earrings. I remember they were like gold and stuff. And I said, man, the stud earrings, can I pawn them? She said, no, we're going to give them to Patsy. They just had a little girl. Oh, man. Can we sell it at the Pulga? No. No. It's for Patsy. So we brought it over. Come on, say, we brought it over. God is a supplier. He plans things way ahead of time. Because when we think that maybe it's for us, it's actually for somebody else. God has a plan that maybe you don't see the supply right there and then. But he has a plan. He's setting somebody up to come and bless you when you least expect it. People are going to criticize your circumstance. People are going to criticize what you're going through. People are going to criticize whatever's going in your life. But they don't understand that God has a plan. Even when they're criticizing you and they're saying, look at them. They're a failure. They lost their pastor. We're going to see what's going to happen to that church. Even when they're criticizing you about that, God has a plan. Something is about to happen because God has a plan. Mm. Bunch of criticones. Come on, somebody say, say with me, the last snake. The last snake. And I had so much else to share, but I'm just going to cut it there. The last snake is the snake of cynicism. You had the crisis, then people criticize you. But the last snake is the snake of cynicism. This is the snake where the people were watching, sitting there watching Paul. And they were waiting for him to swell up and die. So after he was gathering the wood and he got bit, they stood there. A ver cuánto dura esto. You know how many people are standing out there? They're cynical. They say, well, we'll see how long that church lasts without, without Rudy. We'll see how long. We'll see how long it takes for it to fall apart. Because they don't have a leader. See, they don't understand that when the head left... A team came up. A team was created. Now we don't have one preacher. We have several preachers. Now we don't have one teacher. We have several teachers. Several people stood up to the plate. And I don't care how cynical they are waiting for us to die. Waiting for this church to die. People were going to rise up and step up to the plate. People who never preached before are going to preach. And suddenly it won't be one pastor. It will be several pastors. It will be a team of preachers that God will bring to the, come on, to the top. So the cynical people will see that God is good. People are expecting freedom life to die. But God says I've given them life and life abundance. How many of you, of you believe that this morning? You will never make it. That church won't last. You will fail. They'll never make that job. They never even finished sixth grade. And they got the position of manager. We'll see how long he lasts there. They'll never make it. There's cynical people out there just waiting for you to fail. Oh, come on. Come on. But Paul knew when he wrote it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've gone to the cross with him. I've gone to hell with him. I resurrected with him. And I'm seated at the right hand of the Father with him. How many of you remember? What, what is the Trinity made up of? Come on. Father, Son, and who? Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit live now? Come on. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Point. Inside of me. So if the Holy Spirit is inside of me, where am I at? In the Trinity. 
Let us make man. Let us create. Let us change. Let us transform. Now, now the Godhead is part. You're part of that Godhead of creation. Now when you gather in church, you just don't gather to praise the Lord. You gather to create. Now you're thinking here. Now you're going to start speaking into existence, Pastor Ben. Now you're going to, people are going to come up here and prophesy because you're part of that creative trinity that restored the world when there was a mess. Maybe there's a mess out there in people. Maybe people are messed up, but you will come together and say, let's recreate them. Let's reform them. Let's fill them up. Let's change their lives. Mm. Let's give them a garden that they can work with. If you only understood the power that you carry and the identity of where you're at, see it right now. Yo no soy nadie. You know that song where in the last part it says, you haven't failed me yet. Why did they put yet there? I want to slap the writer of that song. What do you mean fail me yet? He's never going to fail me. Remove that part. Put it with you've never failed me. No. Or you just, you've never failed me. Because he's never going to fail you. He said he'll never leave you or forsake you. He said he will be with you till the end of time, the end of your days. He is your alpha and your omega. He is the beginning of your health, the end of your sickness. He's the beginning of your prosperity, the end of your poverty. He's the beginning of the restoration of your marriage, the end of your divorce. He is the beginning of the restoration of your children, the end of the rebelliousness in them. He's the beginning and the end. The beginning. And the end, the fullness of all things is in him. Please stand up and give the Lord a hand. Somebody shout to the Lord, I need to shake this. I need to shake this snakes off. Church, God has brought a prophetic word for you this morning. I don't think it can get any more clearer for what God is doing. Can somebody come? Can, me, can you come up here? No one determines the quality and the service of the Lord but you. Nobody should determine. Not a storm in the middle of a lake. Because that's not where Jesus was supposed to die. When Lazarus, check this out, Lazarus, Jesus' best friend when he was dying. They come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, your best friend is dying. Jesus said, no he's not. Oh, he's not going to die. Did he die? Did he die? Yes. He died physically. Did he die? Did he go to a grave? Yes, he did. So Jesus lied? No. Jesus spoke into existence. Jesus spoke into the future. Jesus spoke a prophetic word into that grave. Jesus knew he was going to die. And he did die. But he says, no, he's not going to die. He's just going to go to sleep for a little bit. And I'm going to go when I'm going to go because I have something else to do right now. You're not going to interrupt what God has me doing right now, what the Father has me doing right here. He was only three hours away walking. But it took him four days. Because there was a plan. See, in order for Jesus to be established as a prophet in the people of Israel, he had to resurrect somebody. And so he decided to resurrect his best friend first. So he... Waits four days. Come on, say, he waited four days. But before he did, he sent the word ahead. And that word traveled. <laughs> and it went and they found a, a, a grave. And that, and that word sat there. Come on, somebody say it sat there. Come on, somebody say it sat there. Somebody say it sat there. Can, can somebody get me a, a, a chair up here? Somebody get me a chair up here. Thank you. This is a prophetic chair. Come on, say there's a prophetic chair. Come on, this is the prophetic word. And so Jesus sends the prophetic word out there. I'm going to keep these two right here. Thank you. And he sends it ahead of time. And that word went... It made itself comfortable in this grave. <sighs> Asked for a coffee from Starbucks, tea. 
asked for it. And it just waited for four days. Because it was obedient to its master. The very first time we came back, Pastor Patsy, and reconnected with you guys after our daughters, you know, when we met and all that. And the very first time was when you guys were at that storefront in somewhere, I don't know where. And we hadn't seen you guys. And, and Rudy decided to invite us against many people's will. So he's kind of crazy. Don't invite him. He's a weird preacher, a weird prophet. But I remember when I got there, one of the very first people that I gave a word to was this pastor. This lady, beautiful woman pastor named Patsy. The Lord gave her a word, which I just reminded her not long ago on Facebook about it. And the Lord says, one day, you're going to rise and you're going to preach the powerful word of God. Because you're going to have to step. And the word was that. You're going to have to step into a place you've never thought you were going to have to step into. So God was already sending the word ahead of time. Did I know it had to do with my phone? But God knew. So that word waited. That word has been sitting here. That word sat there even when Pastor Rudy was preaching. That word sat there and waited. There's a word that has been spoken for this church. That has been sitting here waiting to be activated. Come on, say four days later. JC shows up. And when Jesus got there, the very first thing is the sister of Lazarus comes and says, if you would have been here. And Jesus said, I was four days ago. You just didn't know because you're not tapped into what I'm tapped into. Four days ago, I was here. I already showed up in the spirit. You see, the Son of God lives inside the Son of Man. The Son of God is not a human. The Son of God is a spirit. The Son of God lived inside the Son of Man, which is Jesus. Come on. Say, I'm the Son of Man. But the Son of God lives inside of me. That's why the Word of God says this. Greater is He who is in me than He who is in the world. It wasn't talking about God and the devil. It was talking about the real me. The real JC is a spirit. He looks just like his father, like a God, like he's inside. And the real me is greater than the one out here because the one out here is flawed. The one out here doubts. The one out here messes up. So greater is the one inside of me. That's why that song said, what did that song say? He said, speak to your soul. Tell it. The real you is a lion inside of you wanting to come out. The real you, greater is he who is in me. The real JC that looks like the father, like the son, and like the Holy, is inside of me. Wanting to come out to change this guy out here. So the word was spoken. And Jesus said, but I've been here already. Because maybe I didn't show up physically. But I got here in the spirit. Way before my friend died. So watch and learn. Because if you, I did not tell you before. That if you would believe. You would see the glory. Didn't I tell you before that even if the snake bit you, you would see the glory? Didn't I tell you that God will take care of you even if? Didn't I tell you before? Didn't Pastor Rudy preach for years in this place things that he said? Didn't I tell you that even if he wasn't here, God would still remain here? Didn't he say that? Yes or no? He says, even if I go with the Lord. Come on, yes or no? I saw it in a video. I heard it with my own ears. He said, even if I'm not here anymore, God's glory will still be here because he sent the word ahead. We need to start opening our prophetic ears. I'm going to close with this and I'm going to pray for a couple of people. Is that okay, Pastor? Say with me, faith comes by hearing. But my hearing comes by the word check this out listen to this very careful faith comes by what hearing 
But your hearing doesn't come from hearing the word. Your hearing comes from knowing the word. Oh. When you know the word, your ear changes. Did you get that? So faith comes by what? But your hearing comes from what? Knowing the word. Not hearing it. Because you can hear it all you want to, but if you don't know it, then you can't hear it. So your faith comes by what your ear can hear. So when Nicodemus the blind man heard that Jesus was coming, in his mind he said, I get to see. That's another sermon. I'm not going to preach it. I'm not going to preach it. Because what you hear is what you see. So what needs to change is your hearing. That's why Paul said, I don't care if I was in a shipwreck. I don't care if a snake bites me. I don't care if I'm going to jail. I know who I am. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what he called me to be, the apostle of apostles. But then at the end, I remember in the beginning, he used to write, you know how to pray, I pray more. I'm the apostle of apostles. But I remember when he finally got to that jail, he said, oh, me wretched me. Because there's going to be a point where you have to humble yourself and recognize that no matter what you know, it's all about Him. And the only way you're going to shake off the snakes is to know who He is in you. Close your eyes. Father, Holy Spirit, come on, say it. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Can I step down from this platform? Do I have permission? Is that okay? Can you hold hands? What's, what's your names again? Rick and Cynthia. Rick and Cynthia. God didn't send you here today just to casually come. That was a word you also needed to hear. You came looking for a confirmation. This is the confirmation. The confirmation is that you are where you're supposed to be because of where you're supposed to go. The door is about to open. There was, I, I saw this, how do I say it? You know like when the door has been shot, shut but it's never, it, it never got locked? It was just closed temporarily and, we, oh, and a lot of times we think it, it's been locked until you pull it. The Lord says, pull the door. I'm not going to open it for you. You need to open it for yourselves. Go for it. Jump in it. It's time. You're here because it's time. Do it. Take the step of faith. There's a word inside of you. And inside of you to transform people. It's time. It's time for you to write the book. It's time for you to put it into writing. It's time for you to put it into a teaching. Everything you've gone through, you didn't go through just for you. You went through so you could put it in writing so others could have the faith that you guys have. You're not here just because you came today. God brought you here to be a Lazarus. Because when Jesus got to the grave, the word that was spoken four days before was manifested when he said, move the stone. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. David again. Rick. Rick and Cynthia, come forth. Step out. Come forth. It's time. You've been sitting there too long. It's time to step out. You were just sleeping for a little while. It's time. And you might be active in whatever. But you know what I'm talking about. It's time. Father, I seal this word right now. And I pray for a spirit of health and life. So this couple can continue to be the prophetic couple. The powerful ministry they are. The teachers that are transforming people's lives. The revelation you put in this man. Even the stuff that 
He's even been afraid to share because it's too out there. He's going to start sharing now. Don't be afraid. Share it. It's from me. I gave it to you so you can share it. I don't care how crazy it sounds. Share it. Because you've asked, Lord, will they receive this word? The Lord says, they will. Just share it. It's time. In Jesus' mighty name. How many of you believe that? Come on, just give me a little bit more time. Come on. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. Just, just, just keep praying. The pruning that happened pastor in this church the the removal of some of some individuals there's pruning that's still going to come even more and I know a lot of churches don't like pruning but pruning has to happen because there's a lot of branches that don't produce fruit they just take up from the energy of the branches that are producing fruit You and your team are going to have to evaluate and do some pruning. And it's hard. But you've seen it. And you've told her, Mom, we need to change some things. I know Dad's not here, but we need to change something. Because you, you see the vision. You see. You saw in your dad's future. And you still remember that conversation where he said, Son, this is where we're headed one day. I may not accomplish it, but I'm, I'm wanting you to do it. This is the vision. And so there's this little, I don't know how to call it. It's like, like, like something's about to open in this place where there was this, almost like a, like a mellow conservative Stop that it's about to just break out. And what this place is going to be known for, a lot of people are going to come here. And I'm just, this is just, God is just telling me this and be ready for this. What this place is going to be known for, what, get ready. This is what's going to, I see a lot of college kids that are going to start coming over here. A lot of university kids. They'll start coming over here this way. And they're just going to be, there's going to be more like a student life of, of, of young people that are going to gather together with, with the older generation and God is going to do something extraordinary in this place. There's new blood coming, a new fresh generation rising up that's going to bring a newness. That, that's what, those are the words. That's what he says, son, I want a newness, something refreshing. So if you notice, God didn't send your dad out there. He sent you. He sent you to go and bring back what God wants to do here. That's why you go and you come back. And every time you come back with a vision, every time you come back with, every time you, you, you see something fresh, something new that God is doing, and it's going to come. I just saw a vision of you in front of this keyboard on a YouTube channel all platforms but on a YouTube channel and all you're doing is what you're doing and it's going live and it's in the morning and people are tuning in and you're just worshiping you're not even singing it you're just playing like that and then prophetic words start flowing out of your mouth because today today as as I flow in the prophetic, as a prophet of 35 years, or since I was 12 years old, actually, I, I, I just declare the prophetic anointing over your life where you're going to start prophesying. 
and it's going to be an experience that's going to be crazy and some of the things that God is going to show you is going to freak people out because you're going to be playing some and somebody you're just going to say you know what I see this woman she's got red hair she's got freckles da 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 and that and she's and she's going through a hard time they just told you you have breast cancer and they have told you and that you're going to start praying says you know what I'm going to play a song and while you're hearing the song you're going to get healed Because that was the desire of your dad's fault. Your your dad's heart was that while worship was going on, people were getting healed. That was his heart. That worship would change people. Suddenly, suddenly you're going to be on the keyboard and you're going to be playing and and, son, and you're just going to be playing a worship song. You're going to stop and you say, hey, I see you, man. I see that you're struggling with your sexuality. I see that you're struggling where you don't you don't know if you're going, if you're on this side or that side. But God is going to either say, you know what, you're going to hear this song and as you're hearing it, you're going to be restored and transformed and delivered from that spirit. And you're going to be a man that's going to marry a woman. Those things are just going to start flowing out of you. Suddenly there's going to be well-known labels that are going to look for you. I just saw a setup here in this building of a whole bunch of people here, like a full, just crowd of, you know, kind of like, I don't know, upper room or tribal or any of those people like that. Kind of like that, this big old setup here, barefooted, weird teenagers or young adults worshiping, and it's just there's no chairs and i just saw this picture where there's people just sitting all over the place they're just receiving there's worship going on and there's a, a revival of worship going on and people are just coming in getting healed getting delivered getting transformed that doesn't mean that they might stay it just they're just going to come in and get healed and get transformed how and when that's going to happen i don't know but i'm sending the word ahead of time so that when it happens it's going to happen it's just going to go and sit on a chair until you decide when to do it Revival of this church is on your shoulders now. Sorry. It's a responsibility God told me to give you. And she's been telling you that. Revival is on the shoulders. And I know you've seen stuff, son. I know you've seen how people have done or did to your dad or did to your parents. But the Lord says that's none of your business. Your business is me with you. What I have with you. What I'm going to do through you. What I'm going to do with you. And there's going to be a moment of even humbleness in your life where you're just going to know that it's just you and God. And you're just going to cry because the other day the Lord says, I did see you where you just fell and you just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried and said, Lord, I don't want anybody to see me crying. But you just cried in private and you called on him. And you said, why? And the Lord says, because it's your time. It's your time. Don't run from it. It's your time. Don't run from it. It's your time, mijo. It's your time. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe it's the time? How many of you believe it's the time? So, Father, we seal this word. Can I have that bottle of oil, Mama? Right there next to you on this side. And I'm going to anoint him with your permission. Is that okay? And I'm going to anoint you into the prophetic. Because nobody has anointed you into the prophetic yet. I'm going to anoint you into the prophetic in Jesus' name. Father, I anoint this young man into a prophetic revolution. Father, he's going to prophesy just the way you've given me the privilege of doing it. He will flow in the prophetic, even through song and through music. Father, and through deliverance, Father, you will see. He will see even names. He will see even cities and addresses in Jesus' mighty name. We anoint him into the prophetic right now, a prophetic anointing. Like there will be prophetic voice coming out of this man, prophetic things coming out of his heart. He'll be speaking things even into this nation. He'll be speaking things even father into this world he'll be speaking of revivals to come in jesus mighty name the prophetic is upon you now in the mighty name of jesus and i declare that the fire of the holy spirit reign in you in jesus name and heal your heart heal your mind heal your soul because you are you are the distributor of the anointing and the glory that's coming into this place We good? We good? 
He's just like that, but he's getting ready to explode. You're getting ready to... How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that? Before I turn this over, I got something to tell you. The Word of God says that the anointing, behold and how pleasant it is for brethren to gather. He says, it's like the oil that runs what? Over Aaron, over the head. If you're involved in the, in the leadership of this church, can you please come up here? Is that okay? Can I bring them up here? If you're involved in the leadership of this church, come up here. Or if you're connected in the leadership of this church, come up here. Now, 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 now. Because I, I got a very strong word for you. Come on. If you're part of the leadership of this church, come up here. And then eventually they're the ones who serve together with you and serve in ministry. We're going to, you know, we're going to extend it to them. But if you're part of that, just I need to give you this word. So the anointing comes through the what? Through the head, right? It starts here. But it says then it comes to the beard. Now, you can Google this and study it and find it or whatever, but the bigger the beard of the priest, the more oil it could hold. And the more oil it held, then what they do is they would walk and that oil would drip. And the longer the line of oil was, that's how long the rain was going to be. That's the only thing that was going to be over that priest for his priesthood. Oh, come on. I could come back and just preach some stuff and teach some stuff. But as he was going, he says, but come on, the anointing was carried where? Not on the head. The anointing would come through the head, but where would the anointing, re come on, where would the anointing concentrate itself? On the beard. The beard is the leadership. The beard is the serving team. The leadership and the serving people, the ones who serve. And the anointing is concentrated there. Come on. The anointing is concentrated there. So that then the rest of the body could get it. However much the glory of God is in the team. It's not about planning. It's more about praying. Gathering to pray. Where are we headed next? We want this glory. We want this power. Get together and just put yourselves in a room and just seek the Lord in glory and in power. Get a guitar, get a piano and seek the Lord. Because the more anointing is on the beard, the more power there's going to be coming for the rest of the body. Again, don't misunderstand. The anointing comes through the head. But it is conserved the bigger the beard the heavier the beard the more oil it will carry you guys have a responsibility to the man who started this and now to the woman who remains with a son and that's to carry and what the Lord spoke earlier, that it's not going to be about one person anymore. Because that's what the vision of our friend was. Is that everybody would become somebody, disciple somebody to step up to the plane at some point and bring a preaching, bring a word. Well, get ready. Because it's coming. How many of you are ready for that church? How many of you are ready for a revival? How many of you are ready for a revival? You together? Hold hands. What's your last name? Brayden. Huh? Brayden. Okay. Brayden? Brayden. The time you've been here, you've grown. You've grown a lot. And there's a lot of things that have changed, but there's a lot of... I see like this. You know how they, they prepare dough? That's how God is preparing, has been preparing both of you as a couple, like dough. And it takes a lot of what? Needing. But he's been needing you in this church. Because he's getting ready to pull you in. 
He's getting ready to pull you in. Right? You guys know it? Stand right there. Is that okay, pastora? It's a confirmation. Everybody raise your hands. Hold her hand right there. Hold her hand. Hold her hand. God is, I just saw this outpouring of blessing over your household. There's this, there's this restoration of your house, of your, of your children, of your family, but also this financial like outpouring in your household. You're not going to lose it. No, he didn't forget about you because I know you were asking him, Lord, why didn't you speak to me? No, he, 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 he knows. Keep supporting this ministry the way you do. You're a servant. But he's going to bless your house. And before the end of the year, your house will be completely restored. I'm, that means your family. And everything that seemed that it was going crazy, God is about to bring it back together into life. Amen. Amen. Does that bear witness with you? Does that bear witness with you? Amen. 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 How many of you, how many of you are ready for the outpouring that God is about to do in this place? Come on, how many of you are ready? Honey, can you come up here with Patsy, please? And Come up here. You know, the, there was a chair in the synagogue that sat there that was waiting for the Messiah. It was a prophetic chair. And that chair was there. And the prophetic word said that the one who was the Messiah was going to come one day, open up a scroll, and he was going to read Isaiah 53. Or Isaiah 61, 61, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He was going to read that, that scroll. He says, the Messiah, that's going to be a sign of the Messiah to come. And that chair was not supposed to be used by anybody except for the Messiah. So the Bible says that Jesus went and sat in it. And then he said, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me. And he fulfilled that word. That's why the Bible says that the Pharisees got super mad. He says, they, this can't be the, the Messiah. He's the son of a, of a carpenter. He, his dad is not even his legitimate dad. We don't even know if she knows how to preach or teach. or We don't even know how much capacity she has. But Sid, the chair has been waiting for you all these years. The chair has been waiting for you all these years. Father, we anoint this woman of God with the mighty oil of your spirit. And she had just asked you, Lord, I can't anymore. You do it because I can't. I can't handle this. I know, have a, I know I have a good team, Lord, but I can't handle this, Lord. It's too much. And the Lord says, it's not too much. Because if I could handle it at the cross, you can surely handle it off the cross. I got you. I got you. I got you. I've prepared people. I've prepared your children. I've prepared people around you. To love you, to walk with you, to hold your hand. I've prepared friends. I've prepared family. Even the call that you just made to this crazy prophet was God. All of a sudden, out of the blues. Because I probably was the last person you would probably call. Not because of anything. It's just because we don't, we haven't come in a long time. But we know when it's God. Come on, say, we know when it's God. Come on, we know. Come on. So does that, does that tell you this woman is prophetic or what? Come on. Did she knew what bread to bring at what time or what? 
does that come on does that establish her as a woman that knows how to bring bread to the house or what as a priest because in this time and age even women of God like her will rise up you've even considered asking others to step up and to take the place and the Lord says I didn't give you permission for that I called you I called you and if you have to walk the extra mile to fulfill what I spoke to my son you're going to do it because I'm not asking you to do it I'm telling you to do it because I know you can do it because I prepared you since you were little on the side of your father I sat you next to him I coached you next to him. I prepared you for a long time. And the Lord says, I didn't call you to be a pastor's wife. I called you to be an anointed woman of God. How many of you believe that today? How many of you believe in the power of the prophetic today? How many of you believe we can shake off the snakes? Come on. How many of you believe the fire of God is in this place? How many of you believe revival has come to Freedom Live Center? Come on. Give the Lord a shout this morning.